Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to North Coast Church. My name's Matt, one of the pastors here. We are in our series, The King's Gambit, and we're looking at th- working our way through uh, 1 Samuel, and we find ourselves in chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, flick to chapter 8. It'll be on the screen as well. We're going to read it, we'll pray, and then we'll get into it when this thing starts working. Nope. This ain't working, so I don't know, Stu, if you want to come and sort that out. But let's read the passage. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his first son was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a judge, a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when he said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all they say to you for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them according to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day forsaking me and serving other gods so they are also doing to you now then obey their voice only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them So Samuel told the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. Am I pressing the wrong thing? I've got the jinx, Stewie. No, not working for me. (laughs) But okay, let's just keep going. He said, these will be the ways of the king who reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plough his ground and to reap his harvest, to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men, your donkeys, and put them to work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, No. But there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice, make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go, every man, to his city. Let's pray. Father, we ask for... Mercy now, we thank you that you're a God who speaks, you haven't left us in the dark, you've given us your word and so we ask that you would speak now, open our hearts, open our minds to the truth of your word that we might receive it and see how great you are in your son Jesus Christ, that we might turn from our ways and turn to him again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, like I said, we're in the King's Gambit, and today it is the King who takes and gives. And I want to start by showing you a, a photo of my son Sam's year one Oz Kick footy team. There they are. Cute little boys, aren't they? Not that one, those ones. They're all trying to be tough. 
tough little footy boys. Now, I was the coach for a couple of years uh, of this team until they drove me insane. Picture the scene. Saturday morning, 8.50 to 9.50. There I am trying to control these 13 crazy seven-year-old boys running around the oval chasing balls. And one of two things happened on every Saturday morning. Either if I was tired, I would become loose coach Matt and I would just let them do whatever they wanted to and it ended up in shambles. Or if I had some energy, I would be clear coach Matt and we would run drills and uh, play football like it's supposed to. Now, guess what, which one they like better? Loose coach Matt, obviously. Why do they like loose coach Matt, every single boy on that team? Because they got to do whatever they wanted to do. We love loose leaders, don't we? We love leaders that let us do whatever we want to do. Let us run around the ovals of our lives, chasing whatever balls we want to chase. And that's the kind of leadership we get in 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is a mirror to our souls. It exposes what we really want. And here's the first thing we see. We want leaders who give us what we want. And there's one word for that, rebellion. God's people want a leader, a king, like all the other nations around them, don't they? So that they can be like all the other nations around them. Have a look at 1 Samuel 8, chapter, uh, verse 1. Here it is. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Name his first son. Uh, judges, by the way, are just leaders. That's what they are. That's the way they talked in those days. A leader of the people. Name of his firstborn son was Joel. Name of his second, Abijah. They were judges, leaders in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said, Behold, you're old, your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to, to judge, to lead us like all the other nations." Up until this point, Samuel has led God's people through God's word. That's what a prophet does, right? They speak God's words to his people. And God has always led his people like that. If you know the story of the Bible, you know that that's what God did way back with his people. Uh, through Abraham in Genesis 12, he spoke promises to them. Three big ones. He'll give them a land. He'll give them a special blessing and he'll create a lot of people. He said, I'll be your God, you be my people, you're my special people, I'll give you a land to go into, and I will bless you and grow you, so you're lots. And that's what's happened, hasn't it? They grew into a huge amount of people in Egypt. God saved them through the sea, that's the big salvation moment in the Old Testament. And he led them into the promised land, where they're to be his people, and he'll be their God. And that's where we're at now, in Samuel. They are to be separate, distinct, separate as God's special people. He calls them a treasured possession. He calls them a holy nation. They're supposed to be the special silverware that you have when special guests come over. We don't have any of that, but my grandma did, and it only came out when the silver side roast was on the agenda. Grandma's silver side roast. If you don't know what a silver side roast is, come talk to me later. It's a sight to behold. The silver side roast meant that the special silverware came out. Now, what the special silverware was set apart for a special purpose. That's what being a holy nation is supposed to be. Set apart for God. But set apart from what? All the other nations. And God has sent them reminders all along the way. They're called prophets. They don't just, prophets don't just speak about the future. They speak about the past. Remember, remember, remember what God has done for you. Now enter Samuel. Samuel has come along. God has raised him up to speak his words to his people, to remind them about what 
God has done for them. And he's done a good job, pretty much, faithful job. But now there's two problems. He's old and his dodgy sons, he's put his dodgy sons in leadership. And the elders gather together and see the problem, don't they? But then it's a massive fail. Have a look there, verse verse 4. Then all the elders gathered together, came to Samuel at Ramah. You can see them, they're all coming together. Hey, 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 two problems here, Samuel. You're old, what's the succession plan? Your dodgy sons? Don't think so. They say, behold, your sons are old and they don't walk in your ways. Now, Samuel, you're a prophet. Remind us that God is our king. Speak to us the word of God and remind us that he saved us, brought us into the land and we're to be a special people. It's not how it goes, is it? What do they say? Your sons are are dodgy. Now appoint for us a king to be like all the other nations. And at this point, if there was a soundtrack, it would go, ba-boom. Wrong answer. They want loose coach mat so that they can run around chasing whatever balls everyone else is chasing. It's a massive rejection of God himself and that's what God says verse 6 it continues the thing displeased Samuel when they said give us a king to judge us Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel obey the voice of the people in all that they say for they are not rejecting you they have rejected me from being king over them they have rejected God from being king over them according to all the deeds that they have done From the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Don't be surprised, Samuel, God says. They've been doing it from the beginning. Since I saved them, they keep doing it. And then God says, obey their voice. They've rejected me. Now their voice shall be heard. They want to listen to themselves. Why? So that they can do what they want to do and be like everyone else. And that ends in disaster. Do you know what happened when loose coach Matt let the team do whatever they wanted to do? Do you think they got into lines and did handball drills? Do you think they set up nicely in their positions waiting for the opposition? No, no, no. They got together in a big scrum and wrestled each other until someone cried. That's what happened. We want leaders that give us what we want. We don't know what we're asking for. In the end, we want to be leaders of us, and that ends in tears. And that is me, and that is you. Do you see how this plays out for us? We don't have a king like Israel, do we? But we do have little kings in our hearts. Little voices that whisper to us. Little rulers. That thing you secretly listen to. That decision you make to spend your money on. That is your functional leader. We want leaders to give us what we want and that, there is one word for that, rebellion. And it gets worse. Secondly, God gives us the leaders we want and they will take. And there's one word for that, judgment. God gives the people the king they demand. See, what's the worst thing that God can do to us? What's the worst thing God can do in judgment of his people? Let them go for whatever their rebellious hearts desire. Just let them go for it. Verse 9, God responds. He says, now then, obey their voice. Let their voice be heard, not my voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them, even gracious in judgment, and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told the words of the Lord to the people who are asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king you, who will reign over you. God warns them. And he warns us too, doesn't he? As we read through, did you get a feel for what this king is going to do, this king they want. There was a phrase that just got repeated over and over 
and over again. Three words. He will take. He will take. Verse 11, he will take your sons, make them work for you. Verse 13, he will take your daughters and make them serve you, serve him. Verse 14, he will take your fields and your vineyards. Verse 16, he will take your servants. Verse 17, he will take a cut of your flocks. He will take, take, take. You see, when you put God to the side and you put something else in its place, that's just plain old idolatry, isn't it? It's putting stuff where God should be. And what does God do about it? He lets you do it. And what happens at that point? It takes from you. The thing you think will give you what you want actually takes and takes and takes. When you replace God at the center of your life with anything else, money, relationships, successful work, career, comfort, I just need an easy life, that thing you substitute for God at the center of your heart will take from you. It will drain you. It takes your time, it takes your money, it takes your energy, it takes your emotions, it will take. And in the end, it actually takes you. Verse 17. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. If God's people insist on rejecting God, They'll find them back in slavery, themselves back in slavery again. Your idol will enslave you. Did you notice as well that this time their cries will not be heard? Verse 18. And that day you will cry out because of your king who you, you have chosen for yourselves. You will cry out, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Back when God's people were slaves in in Egypt, in, you can read about it, Exodus 2, they cry out to the Lord and he hears their cries and saves them. Now they cry out to the Lord and he will not hear their cry. Why? Because it's his judgment upon their rebellion. And you see, the first sign is their hearts get hard to his voice. Did you pick that up? To his word. Have a look, verse 19. But the people refuse to obey the voice of Samuel. Well, he's, he's speaking the words of God. They, they say, no, I won't listen to God's word. You shall put a king over us. We want to be like all the nations. Our king may judge us, go out before us, fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said, obey it. Obey. When I was in high school, a friend of mine's sister got caught smoking by her dad behind the, uh, the shed out the back of their house. None of us have obviously been caught by our dad smoking. Don't smoke, it's bad. His punishment, the dad's punishment for her rebellion was to buy her a carton of 12 packs of cigarettes, tell her to go into the shed and smoke them all. And she had to smoke them and smoke them and smoke them until she vomited. He let her go for it. Take that to its end. God gives us what we want. Here... God gives the people the leaders they want. For us, God gives us the life decisions we want. He gives you the choice. If you're going to choose to sideline me and put other stuff in, its, in my place, I'm going to let you do it. That's my judgment on you. Apostle Paul, talking to people who reject uh, God, says this in, in Romans chapter 1. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up. Let them do it. 
in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonouring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than their creator who is blessed forever. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, you're not my king, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. Do you see the big exchange there? And do you see what God's response is? The big exchange is God for a lie. They worshipped and served created things instead of their creator. They did the classic swapsy, isn't it? Swapping out the God who made us for stuff that he's, he's made. Classic trap. And it sounds kind of familiar. Sounds kind of Perth. And God gave them up. God gave them up. He lets us smoke the cigarettes until we vomit. So here's the question. What have you put in the place of God? What are the little kings of your heart that you've said yes to? The little leaders that you're listening to, you're letting take from you, which God is actually letting you do. We want leaders who give us what we want. God gives us the leaders we want and they will take. But that's not the end of the story. We all know that it keeps going. As you read through the Bible, human leaders rise up and fall, rise up and fall. The next few chapters of 1 Samuel, King Saul rises up and they all go, this is the guy. And he fails. Then King David, then King Solomon, king after king, leader after leader, comes and goes and none of them last. No human leader can rule and save God's people. They keep failing, they keep sinning, they keep dying. Only one doesn't. Doesn't sin, doesn't stay dead, never fails. Only one leader doesn't let it all go to chaos. Only one leader doesn't allow us to be like everyone else. Jesus Christ, the only King of kings, the ruler of rulers. So lastly, Jesus Christ is God's perfect leader who takes and gives. And there's one word for that, grace, undeserved kindness. might surprise you to hear that God's perfect king actually does take as well, but he also gives. In 1 Samuel 8, the king they want takes and takes and takes. We have a king that gives and gives and gives, but he also takes have a look at Colossians 1 Paul started with it we'll come a little bit earlier in the piece and see this he that is God the father has delivered us from the domain of darkness the rule of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom so there is a kingdom that's going to work of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins he that is the son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him that's Jesus all things were created in heaven on earth visible invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things in him all things hold together he is the head of the body of the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent for in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell through Jesus. God reconciled all things to himself, whether earth or heaven, making peace by his blood, the blood of his cross. At last, a leader who can pull it off. Did you see the credentials? One after the next, after the next, after the next. This king has the power. This king has the authority that lasts. He can come through. He's a king that not only gives, he also takes. What does he give? Well, there's a huge list, isn't there? He gives deliverance. He delivers you, transfers you from one realm, a ruling of darkness into a kingdom of his own making, where he rules. He gives, he gives redemption. He pays the price for you. He gives forgiveness completely and utterly, taking it all. 
he gives reconciliation. He makes you his friend. And he makes, he gives peace between you and God. He gives and he gives and he gives. But he also takes. What does he take? One thing. Jesus takes one thing. Your sin. Completely. He makes peace by the blood of his cross. The cross takes. Jesus Christ takes. At the very moment he dies, he takes all your sin. All the punishment for your sin is poured out onto him who had no sin. And at that moment, he's the greatest taker you've ever seen. Can you feel the weight of it? It's taken. Jesus takes it all. When I became a Christian at 18, I literally felt the weight of my guilt, of my sin, taken off my shoulders. He's the great taker. He takes and takes and takes your sin. Your sin, taken. Your sin, taken. Your, my sin, taken. Completely taken. And then he gives deliverance, given. Re- reconciliation, given. Forgiveness of sins, given. So let's test it, shall we? Jesus versus any human being. Jesus versus any little king in your heart. Forgiveness of sins. Stand up. Anyone can forgive sins. Anyone know of anyone who can forgive? Any leaders you know of? Mark McGowan, maybe? No. What about holding everything uh, together by his power? Anyone feel strong enough? No leader? No? No leaders can do that? What about making everything that exists? Any leaders able to make something out of nothing? What about reconciling all things? Anyone able to make peace between God and us? Bring the world together? Anyone know of a leader with that gift mix? Can you see there's only one power and authority that means this man, Jesus Christ, this God-man, can take and can give. He is so powerful. He takes all your sin and gives you everything you need. We want leaders who give us what we want. That's rebellion. God gives us the leaders we want and they'll take. That's judgment. Jesus Christ is God's perfect leader who takes and gives. That is grace. So let's finish up. What about, how, what does this mean for me? Matt, give me something to go away with. Three things. Firstly, turn. Turn from your weak substitutes. We must stop listening to the little kings in our hearts. Little kings, little voices will say, nah, go for that. Nah, this will be better for your life. Which voice are you going to listen to? The people around you, the little kings in your heart, or the God who made you and saved you? When you settle for less, when you put God to the side, and whatever substitute that is, when you do that, it will take and take and take until you're a slave. What are you replacing with God? What's the central thing in your life? I just need some more money. I just need a relationship. I just need a good career. I just need an easy life. Whatever that thing is, it is right now taking from you. You need to turn away from it. Get rid of it. The Bible calls that repentance. Turn. Trust. Trust King Jesus to take and give trust king jesus to take absolutely all your sin and give you absolutely everything you need forever trust him let him do take the very thing that's ruining your life your sin let his death pay for it in full 
Let him give you everything you need. Maybe you're a Christian and you've forgotten how amazing that is. He's taken it all. And he's given you everything. What's stopping you, if you're not a Christian, saying, just please, Jesus, take my sin and give me forgiveness and life. If you want to talk more about that, come down the front. Me and Paul will be here. Some of the others will be here. Turn, trust, travel. Couldn't think of a T. That was good enough. Travel will do. What it means is live. Live with Jesus as your leader. Here's the question I find quite confronting. When, some, when I think about it, if someone looked at my life, if someone looked at your life, would they able to be able to see that Jesus is leading me, that Jesus is my king? Or would they see that mm, sometimes Jesus is around, but all sorts of other things are leading that? Travel. Live with Jesus as your leader. If Jesus is your leader, Jesus will be leading you, right? His voice will be the one that you listen to first and most importantly. His ways will be the ways you'll be going for. His priorities will be your priorities. Turn, trust, travel. We want leaders who give us what we want. God gives us the leaders we want and they will take. But Jesus Christ is our perfect leader. He takes all our sin, gives us everything we need for life, forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have done it all for us. Father, we confess that we often wander, we often listen to the little kings in our hearts because we want what we want. And Father, we... Acknowledge as well that your judgment on us is that you give it to us and those things take from us. But Father, turn us back to your son Jesus, the perfect leader we desperately need. He takes all our sin and gives us everything we need for life. We thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen.